Hello, everybody. Welcome again to the Pacific Bitcoin Last Call special with Lynn Alden. We just we did one with Jeff Booth not too long ago. and We had Greg Foss. This is a celebration countdown to the Pacific Bitcoin conference. It's in seven days. Guys, take advantage of the promo code right now. All caps last call to get a huge discount to the Pacific Bitcoin conference. Guys, in honor of the Pacific Bitcoin conference, this is an interactive show. So in the live chat, drop your question and ha this is your opportunity to whatever your heart desires, ask your question and I will I will pass it on to Lynn. So that being said, I'm going to start it off. Welcome, Lynn. How are you doing? Pretty good. How are you? Happy to have you. Lynn, you've been dropping some awesome tweets, uh, some some tweet, some epic tweet threads. Um, I'm going to read one and I'll ask you to elaborate while we get some of the questions uh, coming in, in the live chat. So the first one you said, uh, this was October 31st. It says, over a century ago, when people paid mainly with cash or other bearer assets, it was hard for a government to surveil transactions and collect income tax. Tax was more on imports, on imports, on-site retail sales, property, etc. As everyone began using centralized banking systems, and as most people received regular paychecks that tax could be auto-taken from, the government could shift to income taxes. But income taxes inherently required surveillance, surveilling everyone's activities as ominously as possible. Tech may one day make privacy common again like it used to be, which makes it harder to surveil everyone's activities. This opens up tax collection questions. It's very interesting. And this kind of reminds me of when the Fed was founded in the, in, in the United States in 1913 was also the same year that they implemented the federal income tax. So it's, re it's really interesting how that happened. And I thought of that when I read that tweet. Yeah, and originally it was a small tax and it was primarily on the wealthy and now it's a it's a dominant form of of tax revenue for for you know most countries in the world uh, is to have that income portion and you know when people talk about privacy the right to privacy or or in some cases the lack of right to privacy right it comes down to you know what are the concerns some people have around privacy and my, my view is constructive on privacy i think people i think privacy is a right that is important for people to have i think it's a human right um uh, but it opens up questions about taxation and stuff. And it, it's, it's interesting because people think of – people often don't look at history. So, like, how could this possibly work? And it's like, well, I mean, we have lessons of history. They're obviously not the same. They weren't dealing with, you know, encryption and, and software. But they had, you know, kind of that natural privacy of exchanging bare assets with people uh, in person and how and how a government wants to get their, their rent from that. Um, and there are people that, for example, want to limit something – because of you know potential downsides, like let's say the internet's coming out, and they're like, well, we can't just have unrestricted speech online. You know, what about the people that are going to use it for bad purposes? We have to lock that whole thing down, right? But of course, that's a tiny percentage, and and what really the internet does is open up the world of commerce uh, in in ways that we didn't we couldn't experience before. And I think with private transactions and and things like that, there are people that say, well, what about terrorist financing and money laundering, and what about tax evasion and things like that. And, you know, those are around the margins, real concerns, but that doesn't mean that, you know, you have to then limit the privacy of, of the 99.9% .9 of people that are not doing those things. And I think that as we look out longer term, you know, if, if it is true that encryption and, and things like that just make a lot of commerce more inherently private, if that can outpace the anti-privacy analysis techniques, if that ends up being a feature that occurs, I think it's just natural that governments are going to have to adjust about the types of, of sources they get revenue from that are inherently more visible, more physical, you know, uh, and, and we have kind of lessons of history about what those things are, which is things like real estate and imports and, you know, physical retail sales and, and things that, that governments can actually identify. Absolutely. Guys, this is the Pacific Bitcoin Last Call special with Lynn Alden. This is an interactive show in honor of the conference coming up in seven days. So make sure to drop your questions in the live chat for an opportunity to ask them to Lynn. Also, take advantage of the promo code, all caps, last call. Get a major discount to the Pacific Bitcoin conference. Lynn, I'm going to get my question in before we get an audience question, because what you said was fascinating, specifically about privacy. 
I'm going to reference what the move by the Treasury specific as it relates to Tornado Cash. The first time the Treasury sanctioned not an individual, not a government, but open. this is the scary part. Open source software. It's my belief that they're trying to set a precedent because they're seeing the writing on the wall that Bitcoin could potentially facilitate international trade. We know that the U.S. government gets a tremendous amount of power by being the world's reserve currency. And because of that, they get to weaponize the dollar and go after the political dissidents. So what are your what are your thoughts on the move by the Treasury? It's a scary one. I know uh, I, I spoke to some people at the Bitcoin Policy Institute not, not too long ago, and they're coming from the this eventually will get challenged in the courts. What are your thoughts on all that? Well, so I think, you know, even though that's a, that's an Ethereum ecosystem thing, it's really a it's a, it's a privacy question. So, uh, you know, um, uh, I came out in support of that because I don't think that open source code should be sanctionable. I don't think that you should put a, you know, I think it's a bad precedent that could then spill over into other places. And also we've seen similar actions on Bitcoin mixers. Um, and and so basically what what the way that they approach that is it's kind of a it's kind of a language game. Right. So, you know, let's say X billions of dollars have, have historically flown through tornado cash. The Treasury will call that laundering. Right. Whereas the actual the majority of the usage, as far as anyone can tell, is just people that want privacy, um, that they don't want corporations or, or, or users or governments or whoever else to be able to follow their future transactions uh, kind of indefinitely through the chain. And so they want to break that surveillance tracking capability. And again, mostly that's for for people that just want that privacy. But then, of course, you know, if North Korea does like a DeFi hack, then they can take the funds and go through Tornado Cash and get it out. So there's some money laundering that happens in that privacy. But then the language game is to call all that laundering. They Basically, you, you synonymize laundering with privacy. If privacy is happening, it's laundering, right? And that, that's kind of the language game that the Treasury played. And I don't think that's healthy. I think that has to be pushed back on. I think that privacy is normal. Privacy is a right. Uh, and of course, you know, go after actual bad actors, you know, um, and things like that. And I think it's important to kind of, you know, legally challenge that and things like that, because it, 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 it you know, that that comes to the Bitcoin ecosystem as well. So I think that that, you know, the right to privacy, the right to fungibility um, is something that is it's it's going to be a challenge. I think this decade um, there's more and more kind of um attempts at being able to surveil every possible transaction. That's obviously one of the the hallmarks of, of central bank digital currencies. Uh, and I, I think people should try to support privacy tech on part, you know, the Bitcoin stack that makes Bitcoin use more private where possible. So there's developments in Lightning that, that can make it more private. There's there's developments with, with you know, Chalmy and Mint that can make it more private. There's multiple things out there that can improve the privacy of Bitcoin. I think those things should be supported. And I think if anything people learn from the Tornado Cash is you can't just have one big centralized, you know, like one big thing that is the privacy nexus. I think you have to have like a Hydra where you chop one head off and, you know, a thousand arise. I think I think it's got to be globally distributed and smaller. Absolutely. And I, I think this is, you know, this is why open source software is so freaking important. And I agree with you 100%, Lynn. If you're really reading some of the documents by the Treasury, they specifically mentioned uh, North Korea as the justification uh, for for uh, for sanctioning open source software. Anyways, we have some questions coming in for anyone who's just tuning in. You guys are listening to the Pacific Bitcoin Last Call Special with Lynn Alden. Is in celebration of the Pacific Bitcoin Conference, November 10th through 11th. Use promo code all caps last call to get a major discount. This is an interactive show, so drop your question in the YouTube live chat for an opportunity to ask Lynn what's on your mind. So the first question is by Hotocoin. Hotocoin says, question for Lynn. If long dated treasuries go no bid and rates continue to rise and with GDP flat, meaning tax revenues revenue isn't suffice to meet interest payments, how will the Fed pay out interest? Well, I think if the, if the treasury market literally goes no bid, which is, and you, and you saw that in part of the market uh, in March 2020 during the COVID crash. Uh, we also saw that, uh, you know, happen to the UK gilt market. Uh, if it were to literally go no bid, uh, the Fed could buy treasuries and make it bid again. Um, and so basically you'd see kind of like how the, the, Bank of England had a reverse course on quantitative tightening, at least for a period of time, uh, and reliquify the the government bond market. You could potentially see the Fed have to do a similar move, 
Uh, now, they have more defenses against that than the Bank of England does, uh, but the treasury market is strained. So it is something to watch. Uh, but essentially, they, they have the full ability to, to un you know, they, they can they can freeze that liquidity situation. The problem is they, you know, they can't do it while also doing, you know, the type of tightening that they want. That that would essentially be a, a, at least a, a temporary capitulation on their part if they are forced to do that while inflation is still running hot and still above their target. So it'd be kind of an embarrassing optically thing. Uh, but they have, the, they have the capability to keep functioning if that happens. Gotcha. Guys, you're listening to Pacific Bitcoin Last Call Special with Lynn Alden. It's an interactive show. Drop your questions in the live chat. Also, take advantage of the promo code all caps last call. You get a major discount on your Pacific Bitcoin tickets. Next question we have from Narwell Tacos. I'm curious what Lynn thinks might happen to Euro dollar markets if the Fed instituted a central bank digital currency. My, my, my guess is countries couldn't slash wouldn't upgrade their systems to handle a potential Fed coin. Well, the funny thing is, if you look at central banks around the world, who's been one of the slowest and most resistant to doing a CBDC? And the answer is, is the Fed. I mean, they're, they're, you know, Powell's been, if you ask Powell about a, C, a CBDC, he's, he's not very enthusiastic about it. You know, it, it, it's phrased as like a research thing to look into it. Um, Neil Kashkari, uh, you know, he was, he's been critical of central bank digital currencies. I think that, you know, there's very little incentive for the incumbent to disrupt themselves. You know, they, they like the fact that they're so intertangled in the global system and a central bank digital currency kind of refreshes that, opens up questions, gives time to separate things. And so, yeah, there's there's a good case we made that, that you know, other systems would not upgrade uh, and that, that could change the role of dollars or treasuries, uh, you know, in, in global payment systems. And so I think that they pretty much just want to ride this as long as they can and kind of update as they as they you know, as they feel that they have to. So kind of and now that we're on the topic of central bank digital currencies, part of, you know, the release of the digital assets framework and the executive order uh, by the Biden White House, one of the reports issued by Treasury, released by Treasury, was called the future of money. In that report, Lynn, <laughs> they never mentioned Bitcoin. What they mentioned was payment systems. They mentioned stable coins. And in their eyes, the future of money, specifically from the Treasury's perspective, is central bank digital currencies. And also, uh, wording, not my wording, uh, Cynthia Lummis's wording, says that, she said this at BitBlock Boom, said that specifically Treasury was, quote, the most hostile towards Bitcoin. So it doesn't surprise me that they would release that, support, that type of report. But I also find it absolutely hilarious that in a report called the future of money, Bitcoin is nowhere to be mentioned. Yeah, it's funny. Actually, the uh, the ECB did a similar report uh, a couple months ago. It was about cross-border settlements. And to their credit, they had a Bitcoin lightning section, right? So they, uh, you know, they they eventually put in some energy FUD. But, but you know, the fact that they actually had a constructive long section in there on Bitcoin lightning as a serious contender, they basically were like, okay, here's the current system. Here's stable coins. Here's Bitcoin lightning. Uh, and here's, and they, you know, they talk about how you can do like instant conversions to fiat. And then they also said, and here's central bank digital currencies. And, you know, that's the best approach because, you know, Bitcoin uses too much energy. So they, they eventually got to the conclusion that they wanted to, uh, but to their credit, they didn't just entirely leave out the Bitcoin lightning stack, uh, in their analysis. Uh, and that was the ECB. Um, yeah, the treasury, obviously they, they want the dollar to continue to be at the heart of as many things as possible. So in their view, there's there's kind of no way other than the dollar. Um, and it's, you know, people think of governments as like monolithic entities, but of course there's multiple different moving parts in a government, especially something that's got some reasonable degree of decentralization like the United States government. And so, you know, especially with changing administrations and, 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 and some division of separation of powers. So for example, Powell of the Fed can have a different view of a central bank digital currency than you know, yelling of the, the treasury, for example. Um, and so we've seen kind of um, different different views from different parts of government or different, different uh, you know, stakeholders and entities in that system. And so the Fed has been more resistant to central bank digital currencies or, you know, kind of moving at their own pace and, and, and clearly not wanting to prioritize that. Whereas, uh, you know, the treasury has been somewhat more aggressive on, on looking at that, that future. Um, and so I, did some, I, I think it is something to keep watching. And, and, 
you know, but the United States is complicated because, you, you know, you have the Federal Reserve Act. I mean, it's not easy just to rewrite some of those things, especially in a divided government. Uh, and so there are some actions that would have to go through Congress, depending on how extensive the implementations were. Um, and, and so we can, we can see over time how that develops. But there's a lot of frictions. Yeah, no, absolutely. And speaking of frictions, um, it was it was a U.S. representative. Um, I forget the name, but it was a tweet storm that uh, basically they caught the Biden administration wanting to move forward with the central bank digital currency without the permission of Congress. And if you think the reasoning behind that, no, it makes perfect sense. Right. Um, the fact is that, you know, some people call it the administrative state. Some people call it the deep state. Right. Just a giant bureaucracy in the United States. A lot of the reason that they're even able to be, you know, even able to exist um, is the deficit spending. It's the money printer. And I think that if, you know, we're right about a Bitcoin standard, for lack of a better expression, the party is over. Right. So it. it and this goes to something that I always say, right, which is the people that we expect to regulate this are also the people that stand not again, like you said, it's not monolithic, but are also a lot of the people that stand the most to lose if this thing succeeds. Yeah, I, I think that's that's the correct way to look at it. I think, you know, I would phrase it not as the party's over. I think I think that, you know, now there are other other, you know, there's things that challenge the party. Um it's still obviously very early days when you look at, say, Bitcoin market cap compared to, you know, dollar market cap, for example. Um, but yeah, the, basically, among the United States, and I, I think it, it becomes more prevalent on periphery currencies first, right? I mean, we live in a world with almost 200 countries and almost 200 currencies, and it's almost like a barter system. And they all have these little local monopolies, and the vast majority are not saleable outside of their jurisdiction. I mean, you know, I, I have... I have uh, in the drawer next to me. I have I have physical uh, cash Egyptian pounds, right? And and that's a currency of a hundred million people. Uh, and if I try, I don't know how I would get rid of them right now, right? I mean, where I am uh, in in you know the United States in, in the suburbs, where I, I'd have to figure out where to actually get them converted to something, right? And so they're just not saleable outside of you know that jurisdiction and maybe some bordering countries. And then the same thing is true. I mean, I have, I have Norwegian currency as well. Uh, so that's obviously a richer nation um, uh, on a per capita basis. And again, you know, what would I do with those in, in suburban New Jersey, right? It, it, there's just not a saleable currency. Um, but starting with periphery currencies, I think it's going to be, you know, over time hard for them to maintain their seniorage against the existence of both Bitcoin and dollar stable coins that, that exist now, right? And so as as that becomes more understood and more prevalent among their citizens, that they that they have now the capability to hold things, you know, before, for example, if you were in Argentina and you didn't want inflation, so you held dollars in the local bank, they could just take the dollars. They could just convert them at their at their artificial exchange rate to pesos and, you know, you just got you just got kind of screwed over. Whereas now People can hold either Bitcoin, which is obviously the you know the 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 most decentralized, or if they want to hold centralized stable coins, at least the hub is outside of that country. So there's not much that that country can do about it uh, from from just individuals holding you know dollar stable coins, and that that pressures it. And I think that as over time, the bigger say Bitcoin gets, I mean that obviously eventually moves towards the center. I think it's still a long way away from that, but around the margins, there's a you know growing number of people that prefer to save in Bitcoin than save in dollars. Let alone save in currency X Y Z. You know the the say the 81st biggest currency out there, right? I mean, there's just a long tail of currencies that that people, you know, given knowledge and given opportunity, would prefer to save in something else. Absolutely, and I, I think you're already seeing that um, specifically in developing countries. Um, for the, the case of Nigeria is fascinating to me. Uh, it's estimated 30 to 35%, specifically in the youth population, have already decided to opt out. The government last ditch effort tried to implement a central bank digital currency. No, you know, it's not popular whatsoever. Um, so I think, it, it, you know, and this is what I always say, it's the incentives are winning over the coercion. And I think that's what I'm bullish on. So, guys, you're listening to the Pacific Bitcoin Last Call Special with Lynn Alden. Um, a celebration of the Pacific Bitcoin Conference, November 10th through 11th. Promo code all caps last call to get a major discount on the Pacific Bitcoin Conference. From what I've been told from the SWAN team, 
the, the conference isn't going to be too big and it isn't going to be too small. It's just the right size. So there's an opportunity to potentially run into some of your favorite Bitcoiners like Lynn and ask her questions, meet them, maybe take pictures with them. I don't know. Anyways, next question uh, we have from Stefan Palmer, a little bit of a political one, um, says, what do you think Bitcoin will do if the Republicans win the House and the Senate? Well, so I think you know, polls and betting markets are suggesting they're going to win one or both of those probably, unless there's a surprise. Um, so I think we're going to see a more split government. You know, I don't, I don't necessarily, I mean, when it's already priced in or it's already kind of expected, um, you know, I don't know if, if Bitcoin would do anything that night. Um, one thing to keep in mind. So a lot of people assume that that's like a fiscal austere environment then uh, because you can't do like these big new spending bills. But another thing to keep in mind is that also locks in pretty much the existing tax structure. Right. So it's also very, very hard then to uh, impose a tax increase. And as we look forward, I mean, the United States has trillion dollar deficits. As far as I can see, uh, if you get a recession, they go up um, even not even just from spending in a recession, but from declining tax revenues in a recession while your spending is still roughly the same. Um, in addition, as you know, the Fed hikes rates, uh, the interest expense on federal debt has gone up a lot. And as more of that debt matures and gets, you know, refinanced at these higher rates, because that takes time. It's not all just T-bills that just, you know, um, update immediately. It's, it's, they have a whole duration spectrum that quarter after quarter, year after year, more of that, you know, refined is at this higher rate, that's higher interest expense. All of that blows out the deficit. And, and basically, you know, when you have a divided government, it means both spending and tax changes are, are very hard to implement. And so it just kind of locks in that. And then it puts a lot of questions on the Fed to uh, how you're going to keep that treasury market liquid with all that supply coming to market. Uh, and so, you know, I, I think long term, Bitcoin doesn't really care um, what happens. But obviously, the, the overall, the, the tighter that the Fed can be, uh, that's not great for Bitcoin. If You know, one of the one of the strongest correlations Bitcoin has is global money supply. So global M2 denominated in dollars, right? So if you take all, if you take dollars and then you take euros and you take yen and you take yuan and you take pounds and you take, you know, other major currencies and you look at that total M2 and you, and you, and you, you know, at current exchange rates, you, you say, okay, what is the dollar value of all of that? If you map that in rate of change terms, it's very, very correlated with Bitcoin. So when, when it's going up very quickly, Bitcoin is generally doing quite well. It's a very liquid environment. And when that is decelerating, that's historically been a very bad environment for Bitcoin. Uh, that's what we've been in this year. Uh, and so people often ask, why is Bitcoin not an effective inflation hedge? Um, and it's because it's not a CPI hedge. It's historically been a global M2 denominated in dollars hedge. And that can be influenced by either an acceleration or deceleration of money printing around the world. And it's also um, how tight the dollar is, how strong the dollar is relative to other currencies. Because when you denominate all that in dollars, if the dollar is super strong, by extension, it means the dollar denominated M2 has, you know, stagnated or even gone down. Uh, and so, uh, you know, if a tight Fed um, uh, overall is is not great for Bitcoin uh, in sort of an intermediate term type of dynamic, uh, but long term, the fiscal situation in the in the United States is bullish for Bitcoin. So over the last two months, I've had um, Boss, Ross, Lavish, Lepard, they've all said the same thing, Lynn. The Fed is going to be forced to pivot. Um, so what are your thoughts on that? So I I think people have to I, – I think pivot's not the best word, um, but at times – I think it's going to be more targeted, essentially. So, for example, when the Fed was doing quantitative tightening in 2019, uh, in September of that year, the repo market broke. And so the Fed had to come in and first they had to provide repo liquidity and then they had to start buying T-bills, right? And that was all pre-COVID. Uh, that was before the pandemic hit. That was months before it. Um, and so they basically had to short circuit some of their tightening uh, in order to fix a, a broken you know, market. And essentially what it was, it was like a T-bill oversupply problem compared to the pools of capital that could, that could keep buying T-bills. Um, and they have a kind of a similar dynamic here, but on the longer end of the curve. Um, so I think it's true that inevitably, uh, with interest expense where it is, um, and with the deficit situation where it is, and the fact that if the dollar is very strong, you don't get a lot of foreign buying of treasuries. 
uh, that eventually the Fed's going to have to liquefy that in some ways. And they have a bunch of levers they can pull. They can do repo programs. They can do SLR adjustments. The Treasury can come in and do some buybacks and rotations and things like that. So I think it's more like around the margins you're going to get changes that, that reliquify things. I, I think um, you know, there's not some magical moment you know, where the Fed says, okay, we're actually going to go back to a trillion dollars in QE tomorrow. Now that could happen under certain circumstances, but I think that in, in a more stagflationary situation, I think it's going to be a process of, of, you know, first things change in rate of change terms, and then they probably have to put out certain fires when they occur. Is something going to break? Are we going to feel a recession next year? Something similar to 2008? I know this is speculative, but what are your thoughts? So I would, I would put two separate camps. Something breaking is generally a more financial term. So for example, during the Powell pivot of 2018, um, the junk bond market pretty much broke. There was like no junk bonds issued for like six weeks. The market just froze. Uh, and if, if left unchecked, that starts unraveling things pretty quickly. Uh, and then even closer to the core of the system is repo. So when repo broke in 2019, again, there's no recession yet. It was a slowing economy. Um, and then added, and, and repo broke. And that was a that was a separate thing from, you know, a recession. Um, so I think, you know, there are the, the treasury market is a trouble spot as far as things breaking. Uh, but then a separate matter from that, we do have a number of indicators pointing to potential recession in 2023. So we have inverted yield curves, which historically are a very strong recession indicator over the next six to 18 months. Uh, we also have a number of, of you know, like, you um, large companies announcing slowdowns in demand, announcing slowdowns in hiring. Um, I, I think in rate of change terms, we're headed that way. In addition, the rapid increase in, in mortgage rates, for example, has significantly slowed down the housing market. So, you know, nobody wants to sell if they have a locked in mortgage, if they can help it. Uh, and then also fewer people want to buy because now the monthly cost of a new house is much higher than it was before. And so the whole mortgage or origination industry is slowing down. Uh, the home building industry is slowing down. And those are all jobs, um, for example. And so I, I do think we're, we're at the very least, we're, we're noticing a pretty clear economic deceleration. Um, if you look at the past two quarters, X Energy, the S&P 500, has had two negative quarters in a row of, of negative earnings growth. Um, uh, so basically a, a reduction in, in positive earnings. Um, and so I think that we're, we're pretty much set to continue, um, unless there's some sort of reliquification. I think, I think things are going to get tighter and I think that'll start, you know, ev- continue to trickle into the real economy. Okay. One last question. I'm going to tie Bitcoin into this because it's a Bitcoin show after all. Um, and I, we, we also want to respect Lynn's time. How does Bitcoin perform, or where is Bit? What's Bitcoin going? What's Bitcoin going to do in this environment? Bitcoin's never existed in this environment, right? All most of Bitcoin's history, the the you know the Fed wasn't hawkish. So, again, speculative. But what are your thoughts on that, Lynn? So I, I think it's going to probably continue the pattern of somewhat correlating with global M two denominated in dollars. Right, so that means it's very it's tied to the strength of the dollar. It's tied to you know how much money printing is happening versus how much are central banks trying to fight back and trying to tighten uh, for periods of time. Um, and so I think that 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 is kind of the reality that it lives in because Bitcoin is still a small system uh, in a sea that is a much larger existing incumbent system. And so you know people have one way to phrase it is that the currency that debts are denominated in is the one that can really kind of squeeze things, right? And so most debt in the world, or, or like a, you know tens of trillions of dollars of debt in the world, uh, mainly in the United States, but then also elsewhere, are denominated in dollars. And so when, when they tighten people's liabilities, that can squeeze all assets, uh, and that can, that can include Bitcoin. Um, and so I, th- I think that's still going to be a factor. And so I, th- I think there's going to be ebbs and flows. But I think in the long run, basically, it's going to be very, very hard for fiscal and monetary policymakers to keep the the wheels on the cart in terms of, you know, you have kind of just structural massive deficits, you have energy shortages, um, and you can tighten for periods of time to reduce demand. But then over time, that starts, you know, causing recessionary type of conditions. And then so they're kind of stuck between a hard place so they can they can loosen. Uh, but that makes probably inflation, energy-related inflation, come back pretty quickly. Uh, on the other hand, they could stay tight and then stay in a recession. And the question is, you know, can they keep the treasury market liquid? Can they keep financial things from breaking? 
and you know eventually kind of like uh, you know you get to the end of the road uh, and you kind of have to you're forced to do things like what Japan's doing where they're they're doing yield curve control you have things like the ECB where they're you know Italy's got 150 percent debt to GDP nobody were nobody really wants their bonds and so they're kind of like selling some German bonds and buying some Italian bonds so it's kind of like yield spread control uh, yet you had, you had instance like the UK had to come in and buy bonds for a couple of weeks even though inflation was 10 percent. Uh, which is not great optically. And I think eventually you'll have at least moments and periods of time where the Fed is doing similar type of activities where they're reliquifying something despite the fact that inflation is above target. And those are environments where I think Bitcoin will will you know gain against the dollar. And so I think it's it's going to keep following these these types of activities. Also things like hodl waves, you know, like um, during during contractions, you have a lot of the coins kind of flow out of the speculative hands, the levered hands. And they kind of go into the dollar cost averager hands, the long-term hodler hands, and eventually that that creates a very tight supply dynamic. And so that when there is that kind of reliquification of the market, and new buyers want to come in, those coins are pretty tightly held. Um, and, and so I think it's probably going to just be a, a choppy, cyclical, messy situation as it always has been. Gotcha. Well, Lynn, thank you so much for your time. We really appreciate it. Guys, this was, you've been listening to the Pacific Bitcoin Last Call Special with Lynn Alden, celebration of the Pacific Bitcoin Conference. It's coming up November 10th through the 11th. Take advantage of the promo code, all caps, last call to get a major discount on your Pacific Bitcoin tickets. Lynn is going to be at the Pacific Bitcoin Conference. She's specifically going to be on the... Bitcoin, and, not shitcoin <laughs> yep. panel um, with Lynn Alden, Alan Farrington, Yan, Yan Pritzkler, and moderating Peter McCormack. And she's also going to have a fireside chat with Preston Pish. Lynn, thank you so much for joining us today. We really appreciate it. Jacob, let's roll it out, my friend.